Hey, good afternoon. It is March the 6th, 2001. Oh, I guess about 3.30 in the afternoon in beautiful, crispy Tennessee. I am going to uh, share, if I can, tag friends. Okay, I'm going to tag a few people. Just kind of random. I'm sorry I didn't announce anything. It's been like crazy, crazy world in the world and in my life. And... Um, haven't really been able to announce anything, kind of get anything t really a solid together to talk to you about, but I've been working really hard behind the scenes and I just want to share a little bit of that with you. Some of the things I've been doing that I see around, um, give a shout out and appreciate some of the people who are working really hard, <clears throat> doing all kinds of things. So let's talk about it. Just a couple ideas I have as well. Uh, so we're out of 2020. Everybody's like, hoorah, we're so glad 2020 is gone. But we're really not getting a very good start. And we're almost through the first quarter of 2021. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a little frustrating, I'm here to tell you. Okay. All right, I've tagged a few people. Hey, guy, thank you for... Hey, Abby, Julie, good. All right, guys. So listen. Um... A lot is going on and I am still working really hard. I do have a proposal for a bill this year. So many, many years I've talked to state legislators. Many, many years I've gone down and I've either talked to legislators individually, I've talked in front of committees, I've gone to DC. Um, and it's so bizarre to me because like getting even the suggestion of the slightest little legislative change is huge. And then I look at the really stupid bills that they're passing every year that are either unenforceable or dangerous or just crazy. And I'm like, who? how are they coming up with these things? I just don't even know. You know, I complained last year about the the bill where if you have a CPS investigation and you um, <clears throat> change your child's school enrollment, you can go to jail for it, even just the investigation, right? I mean, it's, it's like crazy. And so what do they do this year? They've got a bill that if a child's in, uh, a delinquent child is being held basically in jail as a prisoner now. So they put children in jail. And if a child is in jail, they are entitled to at least one free phone call a week with their parents. I'm like, really? We need a law for that? We really need a law for that? Is that our state of society that we have to have a law for it? And then what if they don't do it? What, you know, it's like these empty bucket laws, I call them. It's like, it's a law that people are supposed to do stuff and it mandates behavior. But what if they don't? It doesn't mean anything. And a lot of these laws specifically say there's no civil right of action. There's no civil rights attached to the law. So, you know, they put some court, poor kid in detention and then they never let him talk to his parents. And I've had that happen where they've cut the parents off and put the kid in solitary confinement. Thank you, Judge Sharon Guffey. And, you know, they just think, um, that, you know, there's no, no enforcement for that. So, you know, they just put these laws out there that are just kind of pretty much meaningless. And then everybody goes around and says, what's well, a law? So, so, but this year I am asking, also they put a fiscal note on it. So what they do is they, uh, and I'll give you a good example. Way back in 2008, I think it was, I had about five laws I wanted to get passed. And one was that every, one was every courtroom would have audio and video recording, which seems so simple to do. But they're like, oh no, no, that would cost way too much money, which we all know they need it. And then the other law was that every courtroom had a civil bill of rights on it. I mean, we have foster care bill of rights. We have criminal victims bill of rights. We don't even have a simple bill of rights for people walking in a courtroom. So they don't know that they have the right to an impartial tribunal, that they have a right to notice and an opportunity to be heard. They don't know those things. And you know what they told me? They told me that first of all, they didn't even know what that list would look like, what would be on it. And secondly, it would cost too much. It would cost too much. So, you know, of course nowadays, all we'd have to do is put it on a website. But anyway, so, 
I am asking for a bill this year that the court will appoint a family advocate at the commencement of a case and even an investigation. Because just based on my experience, I have found the, the sooner I can get involved, the faster I get involved in a case, really during an investigation stage, the more luck I have, like just diverting all the madness. And I've had this happen over and over and over and you know people now go on the internet as soon as they get a call from DCS and especially if they're in Tennessee they can find me <laughs> and they'll call me up and I've had this a dozen times probably in the last 30 days where they call me and they say I've gotten a call from DCS and I want an attorney that is so smart to do so I can't handle every hundred thousand phone calls that come in every year but if I can train some advocates to get involved, then we can help families divert. Um, I thought, wait a minute, what did you say? I thought is what was supposed to happen. I thought, yeah, that it was supposed to happen. Well, kinda, yeah, Paige, you're right. <clears throat> you would think they're threatening to put me in jail if I keep talking out again. So I know, Laura, look, thank you, Vicki. Look, you know what, they've put me in jail. Now they're trying to keep me from practicing law, all because I speak out about the system. I had a judge say that if I was going to be a, um, if I was going to chase conspiracy theories and practice civil disobedience, I needed to do it as a private citizen and not as a lawyer. Okay? Yeah, because they don't want any change. They don't want to look at themselves and say, this is really not working the best. Okay, we, we need some changes and we need to take suggestions. No, they don't want to do that. No, <clears throat> they want to rule the roost. All right. So I'm going to talk about, so anyway, so this is a family advocate. I'm sorry, I read your notes and then I get distracted. No, you can't, Nancy Schaefer, you're right. Thank you, Tricia. I am, I am keeping going. So I'm going to tell you part of that story because it's kind of interesting actually. But the advocate, so, um, so I'm asking for a family advocate and I am just in my mind trying to wrap around how to make this work because I'm putting it in God's hands because I'm, I'm gonna, t I've told the state rep that's doing it for me not to put a fiscal note on it. We will make it a volunteer service. I'm gonna train, I'm gonna figure out and I'm gonna give them feedback. I'm gonna tell them how it works, you know? I'm gonna give them some stats. I'm gonna tell them what my goal is. And my goal is to reduce foster care by 25%. So that needs to be our goal. And it needs to be your child, it needs to be in that stat, right? So that's what I'm gonna do. All right, so I'm working on it. I've got a meeting this week uh, and I'm gonna sit down and talk about and talk about how to make it work. This could make somebody a real hero, not me, but a, a certain state rep. So in the meantime, I'm gonna share with you, if y'all didn't see it, it went all over the place. But I'm gonna flip my phone around for just a second so you can see this. There we go, isn't it beautiful out here? Look at that, that's the playhouse. Isn't this cool? This is my, this is heaven. This is where, this is Connie's heaven. Yep, mm -hmm. Okay, so this, and it's also windy today. <laughs> Can you see this? It says U.S. Marshals, DCS, TBI announced results in Operation Volunteer Strong. Okay, so this article came out. It's gone, it has gone through every, this article has gone through every major media. It's been on CNN, it's been on Fox, it's been on all the alternative like radio shows where they uh, rescued or they found, <laughs> They don't tell you all the details, but they found 150 children, and guess what? 93 of them were in state's custody. So that means two-thirds of the children missing of the whole state of Tennessee, two-thirds of them were in DCS custody. I would say that's you're not doing a good job, right? So that came out. So. I'm taking that down. I'm glad they brought that report out now because I can use that to support, to show one another factor of how DCS is not doing their job. Whew, goodness, it is so cold out here, but I wanted to get some fresh air. <laughs> I'll tell you why in a minute. <laughs> All right, here's another thing. So I belong to, the American Bar Association has a parents representation subsection, and I belong to that, a listserv, an, e, an email list, uh, 
on that subsection. And so from all over the country, we have attorneys who are trying to change the child welfare system, believe it or not. And they are working hard to make changes in different ways. So we have the Family First Act that's out there. And this is from, where is this from? Hang on here, College Park, Maryland. Okay, so I'm gonna flip this around again a second. <clears throat> This is communication from the National Center for Housing and Child Welfare, and it is communication from, um, and it's from, there, it's down here, it's from Maryland. Oh, it's from Maryland, okay. Uh, and basically what this communication is about, and I'm taking this also to talk in my legislative meeting, just to show that it's a national trend to try to really solve the problems that the fam families are having instead of just taking their children and putting their children in prison, basically. I call it foster prison. So, um, so that this is talking about how housing, it says in 2019, 25,658 children entered out of home care because their families lacked adequate housing. This number is far too high, and yet in the face of COVID-19, the figure is expected to double as eviction as eviction moratoria and landlords' patients expire. In fact, just today, the Washington Post editorial reminded readers that in 2000, August 2020, the Aspen Institute warned <clears throat> that as many as 17 million households are at risk of eviction, nearly five times the average number of the 3.6 million evictions. So. Yes, thanks to uh, COVID-19 and people losing their jobs and having housing issues as a result of that. Going to be another boom in foster care. Yep. So the letter is about how to uh, really get some subsidies for foster care. So, you know, I'm a conservative. I'm not necessarily a subsidy person, but on the other hand, it's we're going to have subsidies for, for families. We're going to have it because... We need help. It's a complicated world out there. And I mean, prices and everything have gone up so high and have skyrocketed so much that some families need help until they can get on their feet. All right. So let's uh, talk a little bit about, uh, so last weekend I went to CPAC in Florida, <clears throat> which is the Conservative Political Action Committee, kind of a, um, what you might call um, sort of a, um, sort of a, our little mini Woodstock, sort of, <laughs> where we have in three days, tons of people come in, lots of booths, different organizations, and so I spent a lot of time meeting a lot of new people. There are a lot of incidental things that come out of that that are very important. Um, met a lot of political, new political candidates. I met two uh, amazing pro-life organizations. I met the young uh, people working for Students for Life. And then I met a group out of Fort Wayne, Indiana called Let Them Live. And they had, a, uh, it's just a young couple that they put together this organization and they're doing amazing job of just helping uh, pregnant mothers get some of the support that they need. That was awesome. Also talked to the Heritage Foundation so I mean, this is, I know this is gonna be backwards to you, but you don't really have to read it. So this is the Heritage Foundation, which is a conservative group, and they have this pocket of postcards, and so I picked one up. And these are all about the things that they're interested in uh, from a conservative aspect, which is foreign aid, the role of the courts. Uh, and there's um, not very many really on family. I'm gonna go through it more carefully. But I think that we have got to raise the awareness. We have to continue to raise the awareness of family as a national issue. We just have to, and we just have to keep talking about it. I'm so sorry, you'd think it'd be a no brainer, right? Another interesting thing that happened is this book that I picked up that was for free. It is called Victoria's Voice. Again, it's gonna be backwards to you. Uh, but I am looking at it and reading through it. And what it is, is a diary of a young girl who committed suicide, basically, who overdosed. She was like 19, 20 years old. And this is her diary. Let me show you. Hang on here. Hang 
time. Okay, so look, it's in her handwriting. And it is, it really goes through her, what was happening to her. I'm going to read one little section. I'm sorry, just hang in there with me. Okay, here it is. Now, this is a young girl who had some, as she was growing up, she had some image issues because she had, her mother had been a beauty queen. Her mother had put her in pageants when she was little. And then when she became a young teenager, she had issues with weight control and some other things. And so she started having some image issues and ultimately very, very wealthy family. And, you know, I'm not dissing anybody for it. I mean, parenting is very, very hard to do. And, you know, we look back hindsight and we go, well, you know, maybe that was a mistake as part of the parenting, but they have really um, put this out there in an effort and they've created a rehabilitation center for teenagers. So I'm ultimately going to contact them, but I'm just going to read part of this to you. I don't know if you can zone in on it here. Ah, okay. The truth about me is I'm not just your average human, nor am I your average girl. What may appear on the outside is nothing compare as to what lies beneath this costume. If you can be my boat, I will be your ocean. I will keep you afloat when your anchor drags you down. I'll be the scale that balances you when you are lopsided. I'll be the road sign that guides you in which direction to go. I will be the one to push you over the edge when you're afraid to jump, but I will also be the one to catch you when you get near the bottom. I'll be the last one holding your hand when everyone decided to let go. I'll hold your pinky with mine and swear I'll never let you fall. Because if you fall, I would be the one to take that fall with you. When you look in the mirror, I'm what appears to be on the other side, because when it comes down to it, the truth about us is that we are all the same, for we all have good intentions, but our differences come from our bad decisions, for I am the circle that never ends, and this is how long I will be your friend. Judging a person does not define who they are, it defines who you, you are, and I'll be the one to read you like a book, but also the one to listen to you read me one. Some say I'm a dreamer, a philosopher even. Maybe one day, hold on here. Maybe one day when we find a place where dreams really do collide. Oh, maybe one day we'll find a place where the dreams really dreams and reality collide. I live in the moments and love them while they last because nothing lasts forever as our future becomes our past. For I am a Sagittarius, I am a philosopher. I live in a dream and hoping that I'll never wake up. I am a dreamer, but I'm not the only one and that's the truth about me. <clears throat> wow. I mean, that's a girl who ultimately took her life but I'm also gonna show you, this just talks about how complicated, I'm so happy they shared this. It's really about how complicated we are. There's another section in here I won't be able to find. I didn't mark it, I'm so sorry. I'll mark it later. Where she talks about how lost she is. Oh, here, like for instance, look at this. What if I don't survive? Then I'll find the answers. And over here again, what if I don't survive? Then I'll find the answers I'm looking for. Oh gosh, okay. <clears throat> I don't know why, I just wanted to share that with you. All right, so, um, and, and really I think it's just a matter of um, reaching, reaching out to each other. I get calls from advocates who are trying to work and help with parents and we just brainstorm a little bit and we just try to talk about what are some options that we can do to help them get through this. Um, 
it's hard. It's hard, guys, but we got to keep at it. You know, I'm just, I just wanted to talk today to reach out and encourage you and just say we can't stop because if we stop, these people that are running this, even on the local level, are horrible. They're horrible. Someone, an advocate, called me from Missouri today, and in one county, the head of the agency like adopted two of the children that she had her agency take. I just, it's just so, such insanity to me that this can even be happening and people don't even believe it. But, uh, so I just really wanna reach out and encourage you. So uh, give some thoughts about how you can, please keep sharing your stories. They're unbelievable, but they need to be told on Family Forward. I do some posts on my, on my regular profile, generally my more political conservative poster there. I talk about what I'm doing politically to try to support conservative issues and conservative values. But our issues with uh, CPS are bipartisan and they're global. They're global. I was thinking I'm just going to lay this out there so y'all can give it some thought. I was thinking about trying to figure out a way, I think maybe committing three hours a week in a, in a, a three-hour block where we would do like an hour on Zoom of kind of an open forum and maybe people talking about, uh, maybe give some people the platform as to what they're going through, but we would have to keep it very succinct and then spend an hour just on Zoom, just with advocates, just training advocates. And then spend an hour doing an interview of somebody who might be of uh, some assistance, like an expert in something, or maybe an attorney from another, uh, another state or community or a lawmaker. I mean, I don't know, whoever I can get to talk about it. There's lots of people talking about it these days. So that's what I'm trying to wrap my head around. I'm also, as a, you've seen me reach out in the past couple of weeks, I'm dealing with the state agency that is trying their best. I mean, oh my gosh. This is not just a matter of um, some type of ethical issue, I want you to know. This is about shutting me up. And it's, they have done everything they can to keep me from getting evidence. Oh, does that sound familiar? Everything from getting the evidence, right? So, um, they have, uh, so the issues they've raised are like, I, I filed a motion for a judge to recuse himself because we have a horrible history and I wanted him to recuse himself on a case that I was representing a client on. I mean, it wasn't my case, but it just wasn't fair to her to not lay it out there that we had a bad history and that I had... You know, I'd spoken up about him for years and I wasn't going to stop. And so I laid it all out in an affidavit and asked him to recuse himself and gave my client a copy. He recused himself and then he wrote this order about how, um, I, I only reason I put that stuff in the affidavit because it was about him having an affair with the secretary, about him refusing to recuse himself on this other case. I mean, it was, I, I can't even remember it all, it was, but it was Judge Lee Davies in Williamson County, who's now, who was elected and then stepped down. There were tons of, of complaints filed against him, and now the Supreme Court appointed him senior judge. So he's basically in this lifetime position appointment. And, I, and so he wrote this order about how he was going to recuse himself, but how I was impugning the judiciary by putting those horrible things about him on in an affidavit in black and white. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Don't ever be silenced. Oh, Kevin. Okay, great. Let's work on Alaska. We'll look at another comment here. New York is corrupt. I know. New York. Basement to the penthouse. I know. So, um, so that was, that's one of the complaints. The other one is Judge Sharon Guffey in Williamson County. We also don't like each other very well. And I think she's a terrible judge. I think she's horrible. I've seen the way she talks down to people. She's snooty to them. She's rude. It's, uh, it's just, it's, I can just go on and on. But there were a lot of families who were having trouble with her and they wanted to speak out. And so um, 
there was a Williamson County Commission and I went and they went and they're blaming me. They're saying I interfered with the administration of justice because I organized, organized a posse to go to the Williamson County Commission and talk about a county employee and what a terrible job she was doing. So that I should lose my license for doing that. That's what we're dealing with. And then one of the complaints about me is Judge uh, Tatum in Wilson County, where he complained that I spoke to a represented party without their attorney's permission. And listen to this, this is why. So this young couple who had a lot of problems, just, just some chaos in their life. They had DCS got involved in their life. The court gave Tatum, gave the grandparents custody, but they didn't give them any support, you know, because that's what they do, right? They give they give uh, foster parents, thank you, Gail. Yeah, they give foster parents a bunch of money, but if a grandparent needs some extra money to help with, and this was three little children, if grandparents need extra money, they don't give them anything. So, so the grandparents had, uh, had uh, asked the court, to give the kids back to the parents after they had a period of time, and so the court did. And sure enough, there was chaos again, and so DCS gets involved again. This time they take the kids again and put them straight in foster care, like 100 miles away. Little bitty kids, like all under six, four kids. <clears throat> and so three of the kids had been in the custody of the grandparents, and so the grandparents came in to see me, and the parents came too, and um, and they had a new petition. Nobody had been appointed to represent them. And so I told them, I'm like, look, this will go a whole lot smoother if you all just join in a petition for the parent, grandparents to get custody and close this out. Well, Judge Barry Tatum had not done an order appointing counsel. It's very clear. I even called the clerk's office. He had not done an order appointing counsel. And so I filed a petition and then we go to court about three weeks later and then he jumps down my throat because I spoke to a representative party and I, he would not let me look in the file. And then when I did look in the file, he did his appointment order, nunc pro tunc, which means he backdated it. Okay, that's what happens when you nunk pro tunk. You try to make it look like something happened three weeks ago that didn't. He backdated an order and then filed a complaint against me. Yeah. And then what happened? It took us another year, another year with those poor little kids in foster care. And ultimately, I won. Of course. Ultimately, I won. So that's a complaint they filed against me. All right, let's see. And then, of course, the Wendy Hancock story. And if you all have been around for a while, that was in 2018 when the DCS worker, like, fled off to another county secretly after I'd already called her and behind our back, went to another county, got a judge to sign an ex parte order, which I say is illegal, and then came back and filed it. And although I'd made multiple calls to the clerk's office that day to find out if anything was filed, they filed it 15 minutes before they closed. Then they refused to fax it to me. And then they had a hearing behind our back, right? And then they came and they blamed us for doing something wrong. Again, took a year, took another year to get those kids out of stinking foster care, eight different placements, 200 miles away, it was ridiculous, right? But I'm the one who's at fault. I'm the one who should be in trouble. That's the game they play here, right? Okay, so what's another complaint they filed against me? Um, Judge Guffey, Judge Tatum. The other one is uh, where they put a sanction against me because I demanded that CASA produce some evidence and produce all their handwritten notes. They refused to produce them by subpoena, and so I asked for a show cause order, and then the judge told him to produce them, and then they still balked at it, balked because of, he said they could redact certain things, but they didn't really do it the way they were supposed to do it, and didn't tell me they had filed them. So that's another thing. They're like, oh, I was too aggressive in discovery or something stupid like that, right? So anyway, so I subpoenaed all five judges for depositions. I subpoenaed Judge Robert E. Lee Davies, 
Sharon Guffey, Joseph Woodruff, Michael Collins, and Barry Charles Barrett Tatum, which is his name. Barry Tatum is Charles Barrett Tatum. Sent subpoenas to their home. Now, unfortunately, we had an ice storm in Tennessee, so they were delayed, but they did get served. So then we have a conference call, and I'm sorry if this is going too long, you can just watch the rest of it later if you've got something you need to do. So we have a conference call. Oh, and by the way, the board attorney has never met a discovery deadline. Never, never, never at met his discovery deadlines. I have always met my discovery deadlines. And so we have a conference call while I'm at CPAC, and the attorney general, Deputy Attorney General Janet Kleinfelter gets on the phone. And I say, and they say, she's here representing the judges. And I say, what authority does she have to represent the judges as a witness? And then they just jump down my throat, right? Just going nuts. So then they say, Judge Guffey will do her deposition on Thursday, March the 4th, because that's what her subpoena was for. <sighs> Gracious. So I filed another motion to continue the hearing. Oh, plus they told me I could only have 15 witnesses when I have 150 people who want to tender testimony about character and reputation. So then March the 4th comes. Now, I don't know if you've seen it yet, but I posted it on YouTube and I shared it. So March the 4th comes. Judge Guffey comes in and Jana Kleinfelter comes in and Alan Johnson comes in and I start my video camera, and I have a professional videographer there. So we start, and I say, before we start, we need to establish who's here and under what authority. And so Janet Kleinfelter said she was there representing Judge Guffey, who's a county judge now, not a state judge. She's on the county payroll. She's a county employee. She's paid out of county tax dollars. And I said, well, Ms. Kleinfelter, and if you haven't seen the five-minute YouTube, please watch it because I can't, I can't blink my eyes as fast as she blinks her eyes when she's answering my questions or click my pen because obviously she was pissed off. I said, Ms. Kleinfelter, what authority are you here under? And she said, Title VIII. Now look, Title VIII is about 1,000 pages and She's been in the Attorney General's office, oh, at least 15 years, maybe more. I said, well, we're in Title VIII. And she goes, I don't have to tell you. Hmm. <clears throat> Something of that nature. You'll have to watch it. So I said, well, I found this in Title VIII, and I gave her the statute, and it says that the Attorney General's office can represent a state employee when they're a defendant in a civil action for damages. Very specific language, very specific. And I said, this is not a state employee, and this is not, uh, she's not a defendant, and it's not a civil action for damages. And can you have me some, give me some other authority? And she t said, well, the, tr the uh, administrative office of the courts asked me to come. And I said, well, who? That's not a person, tell me who. She's like, I don't have to tell you. And I said, well, I says, um, do you remember in our conference call that um, I asked you for the authority to give me the authority? And she said, no. And then she babbles on some other stuff about what the panel said. And uh, I said, well, it is recorded. And she said, um, I didn't give you permission to record me. Yeah, she really said that. She's an attorney. This is Tennessee. It's a one-party state. And it was a proceeding. It was a proceeding. It was a conference call right? Yeah, Laura, I know they link, they kidnap kids all the time. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. So then I asked her again who to call at the AOC because I wanted to call them and talk to them and she refused to tell me and then she gets mad and she leaves. So I put it on YouTube. I'm going to share it again so you guys can see it. You need to watch it. It's pretty funny actually, but it's pretty pissy on her part. So, after she left, I called the AOC, the top of the AOC, Debbie Tate, left a message, no call back, called the Attorney General's office, and I said, uh, I need to 
somebody to talk to me about her showing up at my office without authority. Nobody called me back. I called Friday, called Debbie Tate on Friday, called the Attorney General's office on Friday. Nobody called me back. So I filed a petition for contempt against the judge. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah, she is a nasty soul. All right, you guys. So I kept you long enough. It's uh, really chilly out here, but it feels really good and crispy. And I can't wait for spring. I love the spring in Tennessee. And um, just share this. Keep watching what's going on. I'm talking to advocates every week. I've got this meeting set up with the state rep. We've got a new Congress uh, person who's going to run for Congress in Davidson County area against Jim Cooper. I met with him this week. If you looked at my pictures, I uh, took some good pictures at CPAC with some of my uh, conservative political heroes. But I will be good, got my face in front of them and I'll be talking about them some more. All right. Okay, so I love y'all. Um, I'm going to check out. I've got a few advocates I need to call on the phone and talk to and, and uh, kind of see what's going on. They'd sort of reached out to me. So we'll talk some more. Love you. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.